Thank you for coming. This is Todd Clark. He's a first-generation farmer near Lexington, Kentucky. Um, first-generation farmer is kind of like being a first-generation Jew or Catholic. There's a lot to learn that everybody else knows. But he, uh, he's worked on farms all his life, so he is um, going to represent, for, he's, for me, he's going to represent Kentucky farmers. He's one of 84,000 farmers. We have that many farmers in Kentucky because of the work of this man, the guy on your left. That's Mary's grandfather, uh, John Berry Sr. He, um, his work with the Burley Tobacco Program ensured that um, farmers on small and medium-sized farms could earn a living, growing uh, a little bit. So he, um, because of his work, farmers stayed on the farm, and their kids grew up with the language and culture of tobacco, sort of glued them together in community. Um, that program no longer exists. The thing that helped farmers earn a living, uh, could send their kids to college, um, that's gone. Some farmers still grow tobacco in Kentucky. Um, um, Todd Clark grows tobacco, but um, they're really looking for something else to give them a dependable income or else they're selling their farms. Um, if they have a big farm, you can grow corn or soybeans. You don't make as much per bushel, but you have a lot of bushels. So you can, uh, you can make a lot of money, and the farms in western Kentucky do that. But the trouble with corn is that the price goes way up or way down. Right now it's way up, but it can go up and down. And so doing the same thing, you can hit the lottery one year and go broke the next year. And so... Um, Central Kentucky farmers and Eastern Kentucky farmers will, will rent property to grow um, corn so that they can make money when the money's good, but they also want a, um, another source of income so that they can kind of even out those bust years. Most people grow beef. Todd grows beef, and he grows um, chicken and layers, chicken for meat and layers also, and he started growing lamb last year and he rents out a couple of houses also. So there are people in Kentucky who think that Todd's success and other farmers' success is crucial to the prosperity of Kentucky. Uh, Wendell Berry is one of those people, Mary's dad, and um, he got together with a bunch of influential friends and public servants a few years ago to, to figure out if Louisville um, which has one million people and a three billion dollar food economy. If Louisville could help uh, give farmers uh, another living, a different kind of living, and we we talked about food. Now agriculture is a lot of things. It's corn. It's racehorses. It's bourbon, but uh, food is food is one of the things that's uh, that's uh, considered agriculture. So what they decided they needed was somebody to introduce the market and the farmer and make that connection. So as a food journalist for 30 years, um, I had written a lot about people who grew food and uh, a lot about restaurants who, who served the food. Um, I was a dietetics major in college, so I knew that to live well, we needed to eat well, and if we were gonna eat well, the food had to taste good. So um, local food seemed to me a real natural fit between being good and, and um, tasting good. So uh, as a reputation, having a reputation for supporting local agriculture, they hired me to make this connection between the farmers and the market. Now, I'm not the only food activist in Louisville. Far from it. Actually, Louisville is lousy with people who care about food. So um, you can picture this big room of highly intelligent, active, enthusiastic people, and it's like a big cocktail party. So you go over here and you meet this guy, and he, he wants people to earn a better living if they're working in the food system. And uh, this woman over here, she wants to um, grow food in, in neighborhoods that are underserved. She wants gardens. Um, there are people who worry about obesity. There are people who worry about corner stores. There are people who worry about carbon footprint and water quality. They're all working on pieces of the broken food system. Um, I would contend that if you help this guy... You can, you can fix the part of the food system that matters most, no matter which part that is. So if you help Todd, you can help farm worker salaries. If you help Todd, you get antibiotics out of animal agriculture. If you help Todd, well, none of his chickens are going to be processed into nuggets, so your 
probably going to help people's health too. So. I guess my vision, my vision of the food system is a little different from people who are working in a city in that I feel like a food system is changing the local food system is about changing where food grows, how consumers get the food, and um, where that food is served. So that changing the local food system is really about creating a way for people to make a living farming, cooking, distributing, processing local food. That a great food system is one that sticks around even after the t after Michael Pollan and Wendell Berry quit writing about it. Um, I feel like a, a great, robust food system is one that's going to lift all boats. Um, a few years ago, I was doing some research, and I, well, it wasn't years, it was last year, doing some research on a, 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 trying to find people more like me, because I thought there were answers out there, and they're not, but there, I thought there were answers out there, and I ran across this um, urban planning document. It was pretty sophisticated, done for the uh, Chicago area, and they had done a lot of research. There were a lot of stakeholders, and um, it, there was a food there was a local food system chapter to it. I was thrilled, and I went right to it. And um, they said that Illinois is a $48 billion food market, that $46 billion leaves the state. They uh, said that if, if more people bought local food, that it would help the economy. Well, there's no surprise there. But uh, here is the graphic of the local food system that they illustrated their chapter with. What interests me about this graphic is the access point. The access point for all of sh Chicago land is a farm stand. The access point, according to this document, is the, the point at which people purchase their food at places like farm stands, markets, and restaurants. Todd Clark can't make a living at a farm stand. Todd Clark raised 75 beef on grass last year. He, wrote, he, he raised 7,500 chickens. He had 750 layers, and he could have sold more, but he didn't have a market for it. Two months ago, Jefferson County Public Schools, which served 60,000 kids lunch every day, uh, contracted to buy chicken, and Todd is now going to increase his flock by 11,000 birds. Still, he could grow more. He um, could probably double that, and he's hoping that uh, more schools will buy next year. But even so, 11,000 chickens, or 11 plus 7,500 chickens, will be about a fifth of his salary, uh, of his income. So, um, so he it can't make a living selling 11,000 chickens at farm stands. He can't make a living selling 22,000 chickens to restaurants. He needs, and other farmers need, institutional buyers. They need distributors. They need aggregators. They need processors. Um, but let's go back to the cocktail party. Um, the man who's worried about food, uh, about wages for, for farm workers. The people who process Todd's chicken make twice as much as the people in a Purdue factory make. Um, access, more than 80% of the kids who eat lunch at Jefferson County get them free or at reduced price. Um, environment, environment, uh, um, Todd raises his chicken on pasture so they make the ground more fertile. His uh, cows have better forage to eat. Uh, he doesn't use chemical fertilizer, so there's no contribution to the dead zone. Um, there's no ammonia haze hanging over his community. Um, and he's raising these chickens. He's making the land productive that could not otherwise be plowed. Um, there's a lot of land in, Kentu in Kentucky that should not be in row crops. Um, health. Health, uh, if you've ever bought a pasture-raised chicken, you know how lean it is. But in addition, his chicken are raised without antibiotics and without arsenic. Uh, the other uh, advantage is that Todd's chicken will never be emulsified, added to, preserved, pattied, breaded, fried, and frozen. Uh, so that children eating Todd's chicken will be will be learning to eat chicken and not learning to eat junk food. 
um, all because we want him to make a living. I believe that to change the food system, we need to, to think about wholesale. This is a few of the companies in the Fortune 500. They're the top food companies. There are about 20 of them. You can see there on the right what their uh, annual revenues are. Uh, this is without Walmart and without probably a million other uh, companies. Uh, this is the annual revenue of farm markets. I think we have to engage the wholesale market to give people, farmers, a living. Uh, we have to engage the wholesale market to raise all of these boats. Um, I think if we agree that all, if all of our resources are limited, if we have only so much time and only so much money, why would we dedicate that time and, and money to asking a farmer to take four heads of broccoli to the corner store when if we nurture one institution, we can help the economy, we can help environment, we can help health, we can help access. Some food is more expensive. Excuse me. One more point about institutions and individuals. I think, I think what we need to do is engage more. Instead of going to the corner store, we need to go more to institutional buying. The last three Novembers, I have organized uh, farmers meetings with the Jefferson County Public School System. This is Mary Courtney. She has come to the, these three meetings. Her husband is a conventional farmer. He grows corn and tobacco. They had two children at the time in the first meeting, and she uh, ran a CSA to, give, to diversify their income and, and give them more income. Um, since then, she's had her third child. She's left the CSA world behind. She's concentrating more on wholesale food sales. And, um, and sells to Jefferson County mostly by the bid process, which happens once a year. They bid once a year and get the bid and, and, uh, and go on. But the other day she called and she said that the mini bell peppers that she grew did not have a buyer. And she had thought about calling the gleaners to come get them, but uh, she called me instead because she thought her kids love these, bell, these little bell peppers so much that maybe Jefferson County or some of the other schools would want them. The, their kid size, they're super sweet, they're bright red, yellow, and orange. And so... Um, so she thought that would be a good fit. Now, Jefferson County has a fresh fruit and vegetable program, which means that they serve fresh produce to elementary school students in 40 schools in underserved neighborhoods. Um, so Jefferson County jumped on the chance to buy her peppers. They bought 1,400 pounds. Um, Mary knows a fast food distributor, I mean, a fresh food distributor who, sorry, who can, um, who could backhaul her peppers into these 40 schools and so, uh, so the deal was sealed. So I'm thinking, well, if you're, if you're a proponent of food access, is there anything better than a 1,400 pounds of mini bell peppers going into 40 schools in underserved neighborhoods? If you're a proponent of health, is there anything better than 1,400 pounds of bell, mini bell peppers going to, to elementary school children who, they're, you know, these bright colors, they're very nutritious. And if you're, a, if you're a, a, an environmentalist, is there anything better than having one truck go from the country into the city and putting all these schools on its route? Uh, it just seems to, to work for everyone. Mary can't make a living off those 1,400 pounds of bell peppers, even when you count the 800 watermelon and 60 boxes of squash she's already selling Jefferson County this year. Uh, in fact, I'm going to guess that she made about $5,000 on that transaction, and she still has to pay her people. What what Mary needs is for her produce distributor to sell three or four times as much produce on his routes. Can you predict why he's not doing that? Do you know why he can't sell more produce? Any? Pardon me? People don't buy it. People don't buy it because 
the price. People say it's too expensive. Price is way too high. I, oh, we love, we support local food. We love local food. But the price is just too high. We can't afford it. Uh, that's, a, that's a reason that goes right up your brain stem. It just, it hits you. You're stopped in your tracks. No, no more discussion. What they really are saying is we have a contract with Tyson and we get um, kickbacks for honoring that so we don't really want to buy local food. Or they're saying $3 a pound is way too much to pay for tomatoes. We're never going to do it. And I, I will say, yes, uh, local food is sometimes more expensive, but sometimes it's not. But sometimes, let's go the distance. Let's say it is more expensive. What does that look like? Logical extreme. Uh, Sodexo is a multinational corporation that in Kentucky serves, uh, makes, di does dining services for six colleges and university. Berea College is trying to make a deal with this guy to buy mozzarella cheese. Kenny, Ma Kenny Mattingly um, has 200 acres with dairy cattle on it. He grows feed. He doesn't give his cows hormones. Um, his cheese is twice as expensive as Cisco cheese, and Cisco cheese is the second highest food cost in dining services at Berea College. So I asked Kate, the Sodexo rep, how are you going to make that work? And she said, we're going to serve less cheese. Um, Meatless Mondays at Berea are cheesy Mondays at Berea. So the first thing they're going to do is cut down the amount of cheese that they're serving on Meatless Mondays and serve more vegetables and whole grains. So with one business decision, we have 1,600 kids at Berea eating more healthful diet. We've got a uh, farmer making a better living. We've got a community that's benefiting from the taxes from that farmer, and, we, and his employees' ranks grow. Oh, and Cisco isn't losing money. So that's more expensive food. Okay, so let's contrast that with the economic model set by the chicken processing plant in, in Western Kentucky that allows, uh, that, that processes boneless, skinless chicken breast that sells at Walmart for $2.50 a pound. Um, they're advertising right now for a worker who will make $9.36 an hour hefting totes of 35 to 75 pounds for 8 to 12 hour shifts in 40 degrees. He'll make $19,000 a year, which puts him well under the federal poverty line for a family of four. If he has a family of four, he will qualify for food stamps, Medicaid, free lunch, free breakfast, Head Start, summer meals, uh, supplemental feeding for pregnant women and children, energy assistance, and weatherization. So my tax dollars are subsidizing your ability to buy boneless, skinless chicken breast at Walmart. Meanwhile, our... Uh, <laughs> I've only got two minutes left, and of course I've got 20 minutes more to say. So, um, but I will just say, you know, they tell me to, the, I, I'm supposed to leave you with one thought, and I, and I do have that thought, but really the subliminal thought is never eat boneless, skinless chicken breast again. So, <laughs> so, um, so, so meanwhile, we are entrenching the, uh, the, horrible lifestyle that we are, uh, we're colluding to keep these people in indentured ser servitude, these food service workers, and we are, um, you know, we, environmental degradation still goes on and on. So, um, oh, plus we've got a, a, a community that has to spend its resources to support the living of the, of the workers rather than having the taxes that the workers earn contribute to the, um, to the robust economy of the, of the community. So, uh, so I have lots of stories and no time to tell them, and I'm sorry. Um, but I want to say that uh, at the University of Louisville, Sodexo, we've spent two years trying to get them to buy beef, local beef and local product. When I first went in there, the, the food service director said, we can't buy local beef because the only beef we can buy that's local is it's a whole beef. And we can't, we can't do that. Of course not. And so, um, so we've been working for two years. They buy a little lettuce for orientation. We have a special meal that celebrates the harvest. We're, we're pushing that local food. And um, 
In April, he realized that the only way he could afford to buy local beef was to buy a whole beef. So he's buying a whole beef. He's bought a whole beef every single week since April. Uh, he can leave, his chef can leave, and that whole beef is coming through the door every week. So to me, that's a change in the food system. I'd like to say that I understand that food, local food can be expensive. There's some local food that will never be cheap, boneless, skinless chicken breast that's antibiotic free and local is never gonna be two to 250 a pound, but Jefferson County Public Schools can serve dark meat chicken and um, it's not as cheap as chicken nuggets. So are chicken nuggets a better choice? Uh, so um, I just wanna suggest that I think that, that High price is a, the high price of, of local food is a straw man that's meant to stop us in our tracks, to go right up our brain stem, to make us say it's not worth working on. It's not worth fixing this, the food system. I'd like to say that when someone says the cost of local food is too high, that that's a call to action. We hear it as a call to action, that the high price of local food is the starting point where we program shift. That the minute we hear, I can't afford local food, we see it not as a conversation stopper, but as the point to move forward. If we can, when we hear the cost of local food is too high, if we can engage our frontal cortex and say, not okay, I understand, but the cost of food is too high, how can we make this work? Thank you for your time.